starting now. I think that we may begin. It's after 4.30. We may have, do we have any students logged on line yet? Well, good. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this course with Sovereign Grace Academy. This course is entitled Introduction to Church Life and Ministry, and it will take us through the fall of it says fall of 2021. That's the last time I did it. It's fall of 2023. Uh, so forgive my, um, forgive my error on the syllabus. I'm just realizing I made that error. It is interesting, though, that this class does mark the second full rotation through our courses. Sovereign Grace Academy offers a two-year program with eight core classes. And so... This is the second time I've taught this class, meaning this is the second time we have gone through all two years. So this is, this is the anniversary of our fourth year doing this uh, program. And so if you've been through an entire two years and you've done all of the work and you've turned in all of the papers and or done the finals, like Corey, you will receive a diploma of basic ministry training. If you have not done all the papers and everything, then you, you won't. You have to basically, you have to have eight certificates. It's sort of like a, um, you, like you add it together. Once you get eight certificates, that becomes your two-year ministry <coughs> diploma. And this course, as I said before we started, this course is either a great place to end or a great place to begin. I know some of you, this is your first class with us, and that's great. You can start with Introduction to Church Life and Ministry. But it's also was originally designed to be the last thing that you did as a way of sort of preparing you to take the two years worth of material that you learned and go and use it in your church. So it's, like I said, it's a great place to end, but it can also be a great place to begin the next class, at least the plan, is to start back over next term with, uh, with our survey of the Old Testament, because that will be the next course. But it's not going to be taught by me. <laughs> next course will likely be a rotation between Dr. Burt Jordan and Brother Mike Collier, one of our elders. So we're working on a different idea for next term. So it's just an idea we're working on. Bert has a lot of experience in Old Testament. Mike loves the Old Testament, so we're working on possibly doing that. I may share some of it. depends on how it all works out. But uh, that course is going to be quite a bit different than this one. So keep that in mind for the future. Tonight's course will introduce the student to various aspects of church life and ministry, including leadership, membership, finances, missions, etc., each student will be encouraged to discover the place in Christ's church where he has uniquely gifted them to serve. So this is what we're going to do tonight in our first class. We are going to examine the syllabus. I just read the course overview. We're going to look at the whole syllabus. Then we are going to have an introduction to ecclesiology. What is ecclesiology? Study of the church. That's what this class is, essentially. You call it ecclesiology, nobody shows up. So we call it introduction to church life. <laughs> People know what that means. But it is essentially ecclesiology. And then we are going to talk tonight about the purpose and the mission of the church. So if you take out your syllabus, we'll walk through the syllabus together. <coughs> and I do ask for your grace in regard to my voice. I'm losing my voice and I've been talking all day, so I'm at, the, I'm at the end of it. But you'll notice under course overview, I just read that. Below that, you have required text. Everyone is required to have a copy of God's Word. 
You can choose whatever translation you want, but if you bring the Passion Translation, you automatically get a half off of your final. So don't bring the Passion Translation, but most of the other ones will work. You also have to have a copy of this book, A Biblically Functioning Church. Now here's the great thing about this semester, or this term. This book is free online digitally. You can go to sgfcjax.org slash books and you can download a free digital copy. This book is free because I wrote it and I wanted it to be available in whatever way people could. Now the hard copy I can't give away for free only because it costs me money. I can't just turn around and give it away. So there is a small fee. If you order it online and you're an online student, it's $15 plus shipping. So it would be right around 20 bucks probably. But if you're in class, I have copies that I was able to get, and I will sell it to you for $10, but only in class. I'm not shipping these out. If you want it shipped, go to the, the, the publisher, and they'll ship it to you, and it's only a few extra dollars. But it would be more, it'd cost me more to ship it than it would uh, in time and everything. So just you can go get a hard copy if you'd like if you're an online student. But again, you don't have to have it. You can go digitally if you want to use your Kindle or phone or whatever it is you read on. You can read it digitally for free by going to the website. If you're an online student and you have not registered for the course, you have to register for this course or you do not exist, at least not in regard to the course. You have to register at SovereignGraceAcademy.org. Create a username from there. You'll be able to enroll in the course and enroll on this form. If you're having trouble enrolling, message me. The email is on the top of the syllabus, foskyjax at gmail.com, and I will help you. But try to get it done and get registered. You have, to, you have to participate in person if you're in person in class, or you have to participate online, and you will prove your participation by taking notes. You'll notice that your notebook assignment is 25% of your final grade. If you do not have a notebook at the end of the course, I will assume you did not pay attention during the lectures because while you're paying attention, you should be taking notes. And therefore, if you have no notebook, I have no evidence that you were paying attention. The reading assignment is also 25% of your final grade. And I will know if you read only by virtue of your own honor. I'm taking that on the honor system that you're going to read because I can't prove that you've read. But in class, at least I will ask you questions from the book and maybe that will help. Oh, and also the midterm quiz and the final exam will be drawn out of the book. So if you don't read the book, you probably won't pass the exam. So keep that in mind as well. The final examination is 50% of your grade. If you pass it, you will probably pass the class because that means you did everything else to be able to pass it. I still have some certificates to get out from last semester. If you did a final exam last semester and you have not received your certificate yet, raise your hand. You didn't receive it. Now, I sent yours to your email, but if it, I, okay, I'll check. And who was the other one? You received your certificate, huh? That's what I meant. If, if you want a printed copy, that's fine. AJ and his brothers offered to print a very nice certificate. For any, they have a professional printing company, and they said they would print certificates on nice paper for anyone who wants that. So they're not here tonight, but I think they are coming this semester. So if they come next week, okay. I can mention it to them. and they'll Because when I print it, it's, it's not bad, but if they print it, it'll look a lot nicer. So um, maybe we could work out a thing where you send them the PDF and they can print it for you. Um, and well, that'll be something special for people that are here. But everyone else who is online gets theirs through digital. I had to move to that because I can't ship certificates. It's just not, I'm not able to do that for time sake. People are able though, if they want to print them, as I always say, suitable for framing. <laughs> yeah. So do, do with that how you wish. But, but we'll talk to AJ and his brothers next week and see if they're still interested and able to do that for us. All right, on the other side of the sheet, you'll notice our course schedule. And the course schedule this semester is different. In fact, it's quite different because you'll notice it's only seven weeks. And the reason for that is because getting into the holiday season, there's some church events that we, were, we did not want to bump into. 
So we have seven Sunday afternoons and one Wednesday night. If you cannot come on the Wednesday night, you can do that remotely. But I do know, like you guys, y'all don't have church on Wednesday night. So if you can be here, please come. Um, and you'll notice that that is on the 29th of November. So it is um, it's exactly one month from now that we'll have a Wednesday night class. If you can't be here, that's fine. Like I said, you'll be able to, it'll be online and you'll be able to watch it. And you'll notice that week there's no extra reading for that class. I made sure that that class has no additional things because you're going to have essentially two classes that week. You'll have the Sunday night and then the Wednesday night. And I didn't want to double up your reading for the week. So um, I, I didn't know any other better way to do it. And I think this works out for us at least for this semester to be able to make it happen. You'll notice that each of the lectures deals with a different subject regarding the church. Tonight is an introduction. Next week, we're going to talk about joining a local church. We're going to talk about whether or not membership is biblical, church government, and expectations. The third lecture, we're going to talk about positions in the church. We're going to talk about what is an elder and a deacon. What is a missionary? And we're going to discuss some other positions in the church. Is it right or wrong to have a youth pastor? Is it right or wrong to have a music pastor? Is it right or wrong to have finance officers? And we're going to discuss that as a, you know, how does the church function today? In lecture four, we're going to have a lot of fun because we're going to talk about gender and not, there's only two. Let me just say that. Okay. But that's not what we're going to discuss. In that class, we're going to discuss ministry of men and women in the church. And particularly the issue of what roles are limited to men in the church. Lecture 5, we're going to look at ministry in the local church, look at gifts, partnerships with parachurch organizations, and we're going to talk about the concept of cessationism and continuationism that regards the spiritual gifts of healing and tongues. In lesson 6, we're going to look at ministry in the local church, regarding hospitality, bereavement ministry, and meeting needs regarding people who are going through times of grief, such as marriages, I mean funerals. <laughs> but we're going to go through all of that in lesson six. Lesson seven, we're going to talk about conflict in the church, specifically regarding conflict management, church discipline, and the process of church discipline. What does the Bible teach us and how do we actually work that out? And what are the biblical methods? Finally, in week eight, we're going to talk about supporting the local church. We're going to talk about compulsory versus voluntary giving, the purpose and manner of giving, and then we're going to discuss. This says research project. That should say final because in our last class, we're going to discuss the final. Um, so that's everything. Does anybody have any questions about what we're going to be doing over the next eight weeks? Pretty well outlined? Well, good. All right, so tonight's class, you will have the PowerPoint, which will be up here on the screen, which may help you take notes. Uh, if you need me to stop or go back, I'm happy to do that. And uh, keep in mind that this is being videoed, so if later you want to go back and reference the video and be able to see the screens, you can do that. So we're going to move on now to our introduction to ecclesiology. <coughs> the English word church is related to the Scottish word kirk and the German designation Kirch. And all of these terms are derived from the Greek word koreakon. Now the word koreakon is the neuter adjective of the word koreas. Koreas is the Greek word for Lord. And so koreakon means belonging to the Lord. And therefore when we use the word church, we're actually using, we're, we're referencing the fact that the church is the Lord's, that it's His. That's where that word comes from. And koreos is an important word. It all kind of reminds us of the word curious, but it's not the same. 
Koryas is the word that is often translated in the New Testament from the Old Testament word, which was for God, which was Yahweh. You'll see any time the Old Testament translates Yahweh and it translates it in English as what? Lord. When the New Testament translates the word Lord, it's the word Koryas. So Koryakon means belonging to the Lord. But the Greek word is not the same. The Greek word that we often see translated church in the Bible is actually the word ekklesia. Ekklesia, the Greek dictionary defines this word as a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place. And this is the key. The word church means assembly. Assembly. The word ecclesia literally means an assembly of the called or those who have been called out of their homes into an assembly. <coughs> and I, 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 I stress this because you have probably heard people say that the word ecclesia comes from ek, which is the prefix which means out of, like exit means out of, or exodus means to go out. And the word kaleo, which means call. And so some people will say the church, ecclesia means those who are called out. That is true when we deal with the word, the, the, the word in its etymology, meaning the study of what the word parts are. It does mean called out. But in its usage... It means more than called out. It means called out into an assembly. It refers to an assembly. And the reason why I make this point, and Dr. James White talks about this, he says, he says, you know, the word television, if you break down the word television, tele and visio means far-seeing. Tele and visio mean far-seeing. But TV does not mean far-seeing. <laughs> Television means something else. We put those words together to mean television. And in the same way, ecclesia does mean called out. It actually means assembly. In the same way television means television, ecclesia is the assembly. This is going to become important later when we start talking about some of the myths of the church. When people consider the church not a group, some people think, some, and you'll hear people say this, and I'm going to deal with it in a little while. People say, I am the church. Well, not by yourself, you're not. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. But the idea of church is assembly. And the word church in the New Testament is most often found in the book of Acts and in the epistles. And some have even argued that Jesus did not come to establish a church, but that it was a later invention of the apostles. They say... Well, Jesus didn't come to make a church. That was something that came later. But they say this in ignorance because Christ himself spoke of the church in Matthew 16, 18. In fact, the word church is only found twice in the Gospels. Both are in the Gospel of Matthew. And both are from the words of Jesus. And they're both referring to the same assembly. In Matthew 16, he says, I will build my church. And in Matthew 18, he says, if a person sins against you, you take him before the church. It's only two times the word church use, is used, but Jesus uses the word for us to understand that the church was his purpose. He came to build a church. When somebody says Christ didn't come to create a church, that's false. He literally said the opposite. He said, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will build my church, is the words of Christ. And therefore, and here's a thought, if the church is important to Christ, it must be important to us. What's that? Go ahead, you got a question? Oh, go back, sure. 
But if the church is important to Christ, it must be important to us. That is an important thought to just consider. That there are people who want to write the church off. How many of you remember Family Radio? And Harold Camping. Harold Camping became a, a man who started to set the date for the rapture when Jesus was going to return. But he had started Family Radio, which was a Christian radio network. And as he began to get more invested in his view of eschatology, which is the view of the end, he began to become more disenfranchised with ecclesiology and it finally came to the point where he actually encouraged people to abandon churches. He, he believed all of the churches had gone astray and what you should do is abandon the churches and listen to family radio, which is convenient since he owned family radio. But his view was all of the churches are wrong. All of the churches are bad. And there are no good churches. How many of you ever heard that? How many of you ever heard somebody say, there are no good churches? There are no worthy churches, and, and everybody should just abandon the churches. Now, I will say that I agree that there are many bad churches. I sort of make a, 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 a hobby of, of pointing out some of those bad things in my online ministry, and, and you know I tease some of those bad churches. But at the same time, I would never say that there are no good churches because obviously I pastor a church, but also I wouldn't say we have the only good church. That would be unfair. I believe our church is biblical. I believe our church is seeking God. And I believe there are many churches in Jacksonville and Newley that are seeking God. So when we talk about the church, yes, there are churches that are not good. Yes, there are churches that are bad. But... That doesn't mean we write off the concept of church altogether. I got to move on, brother. Uh, you, you won't be able to type every word. Oh, just I'm saying. I'm good. I'm okay, good. I'm just saying. All right. All right. So if the church is important to Christ, it must be important to us. I like this quote from C.H. Spurgeon, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He said, The church is not perfect, but woe to the man who finds pleasure in pointing out her imperfections. Christ loved his church and let us do the same. I think that's a beautiful thought. That we ought to consider that even in her imperfection, she still belongs to Christ. She is his bride and therefore the church should matter to us because it matters to Christ. <clears throat> but when we talk about the church, of what do we speak? Are we talking about the church as the universal body? Or are we talking about the church as the visible local body? So that brings up the next point. There is a sense in which you can consider the church in two different ways. <clears throat> Sometimes referred to as the universal church. That's where the word Catholic comes from. The word Catholic simply means universal is also referred to as the invisible church. It is made up of all believers everywhere who are truly converted. So if I were to board a plane today and I were to go see my son in Germany where he now resides in the Air Force and I were to get off the plane at his base and I were to go to a local church and I were to sit down with other believers I could say that those believers, if they are in Christ, are part of the same body of Christ that I am in the sense that we are all part of the universal body of Christ. Some people don't like the term universal church because the Bible really doesn't use the term church in a universal sense. It almost always uses the word church in the local sense. However, we have to understand that if a person is part of the body of Christ, then they are part of the universal body of Christ. That we are all one body, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. Unless you're a Southern Baptist and you've probably been baptized three times. <laughs> That's a little poke at my Baptist brother. But 
the term invisible church and universal church, while I think it is, it has its place, it will not be, the, the majority of this class will not be concerned with that. Even though I do believe it has its place as far as nomenclature and definitive or definition, it's not what we're talking about. When we talk about the church, we are more specifically referring to the visible and local church. What's wrong, Daisy? Oh, okay. Sorry. It is small, isn't it? Sorry. Well, the visible and local church is made up of local believers in communion with one another. And I would add one word if you want to add a word here. I would actually also say in covenant with one another. We talk about that in this church as covenant membership, meaning that we, we, we agree together to work together as members of this body for the building up of the kingdom here. Right? That's that's we're we're in a covenant together. We we agree to certain things and we're gonna talk about later in the course about what we agree to, what do what do we what do we commit to doing when we when we come together and we, we become members. Church membership is more than just country club membership. And we'll talk about that in a little while, but the idea of being a member of a church means you're coming together in covenant with other people. You're agreeing with them under God to do something together. And so it's communion, it's also covenantal. Now you don't you probably can't read this little part, but this is more for me to read to you. When a person is born again and comes to faith in Jesus Christ, he's immediately made part of the universal or individual invisible church. He becomes part of the global body of Christ or the universal assembly of the saints. But this does not automatically mean that he's joined to a local assembly of believers. That requires, and here's the key, submission and accountability. See, when you, when you believe in Christ, you are a Christian, but that doesn't mean you're a member of a local church. But when you become a member of a local church, now you are submitted to leaders and you're accountable to one another. That's what changes. And, and, and I can say this. In the vast majority of cases, when the Bible uses the word church, it's referring to the local visible body of believers. Why? Because it's almost impossible to hold anyone to a standard if they don't have a community in which those standards are upheld. Yes, Mark? Um, if you're a part of a visible church, does that, you're, that doesn't automatically make you a part of the invisible church. Uh, am I right? Or am That's I'm true. Right? You, you certainly can be a member of a visible church and not be part of the invisible church because you can be a false professor. And how does that work itself out? Normally it works itself out through demonstration of apostasy, abandoning the faith or, or something like that. But the scary and sad thing is that people can be in church for years and not be believers going through the motion of church and die in unbelief. That's really scary. Um, but it do happen. But it do, yeah, Matthew 7, right? Lord, Lord, did we not do this? Did we not do that? But yeah, so, so being a part of the visible church doesn't mean you're part of the invisible church. However, if you're part of the invisible church, you should be part of a visible church. You should be in a local church. And if you're not, you should ask yourself why. And, and I did a podcast about this last year. Me and um, Kenny Roberts, he's the pastor of Mission Way Church on the other side of town. We did, a, we did a podcast asking the question, what if there are no good churches in my neighborhood? Or what if there are no good churches in my town? Right? And there are people who say that to me. They'll call it, man, there's just no good churches within 50 miles. Well, drive 55 miles if that's what it takes. I mean, you would move if you needed a job, right? If, if it took being, you know, supporting your family, you would move. Why would you not move to be in fellowship with a, with a godly church if that's what it took? If you, li if you really live. And, and honestly, most people don't. Most people just don't. They, the, the churches they go to, they don't want to submit to or they don't want to be a part of, whatever. But that's a, more, more for a later time. The point is, in general, if you're part of the believing body of Christ, you should be part of the church. And if you're not, you should ask yourself why. What is it that's keeping you from being part of a local church? So this course will focus on understanding the purpose, mission, and structure of the local church and discovering your place within. Because everybody has everybody who is a believer has a place in the local church. Everybody who's a believer has a place in the local body of Christ. 
That doesn't mean everybody is called to be a leader. That doesn't mean that everybody's called to have a title. Um, think about, this is a good point, how many, how many people were in the church when the first deacons were called? It was thousands, right? It was like 3,000. How many deacons were called? Seven. Yeah, out of 3,000. <laughs> you know, we have a church of around 100 people, approximately, and we got four deacons and three elders. Interesting, right? And sometimes, like, is that enough? Well, it was seven was enough for 3,000. It's interesting. Not everybody needs a title. Not everybody needs that. But we all serve. Everybody has a place in the body. So when we talk about the church, I want to introduce you to three fallacies regarding the church. Three false ideas that come in regard to the church. Dangerous fallacy number one. I am the church. I mentioned this one earlier. I want to dig in a little bit. I actually have on the screen, this is a post that I put up five years ago. It says three years ago, but the last time I did this class was two years ago. So this was actually five years ago now. This was a post that I posted, and this is what it says. It says, met a sweet young man tonight, and we had a great talk about the gospel. In the conversation, Jennifer asked him if he attended church, and he replied, I am the church. And I said, the word church means assembly. It's literally impossible for you to be the church all by yourself. <laughs> I, I just saved that as a reminder to myself of that conversation. I remember where we were. We were at Longhorn. This young man was a wonderful young man, sweet young man. He sang happy birthday to my wife, and it sounded just as smooth as butter. It was very beautiful. And we began to talk. And my wife asked him, do you attend church? And he says, no, ma'am, I am the church. The problem with that statement, especially in the context he was making it, I don't need to go because I am the church, misunderstands the nature of the church. It is based on the fact that the church is not a building but the people, and that's true. In fact, I'll give a shout out to Brother Shane Waters' church. Uh, Shane Waters is the pastor at Sovereign Grace Baptist Church. I do like one thing, not just one thing, but I do like one thing. <laughs> And that is his sign. It doesn't say Sovereign Grace Baptist Church, but it says Sovereign Grace Baptist Church gathers here. Which is to say that the church isn't the building, but the church is the people who gather there. I agree 100%. That's great. And I like the way that's worded. And I, and I think that they probably as a church... In their, you know, in their history, because Shane and I have been friends for years, they were at the YMCA for years. So they were gathering in a building that wasn't their own. They were the church, even though they didn't have a building. And then they got the building. Well, the building doesn't automatically become the church because it's still the people. And so I get the idea when someone says the church isn't the building. I say praise and amen. I agree. But the church isn't you by yourself either. <laughs> The church is the assembly of the, the, the believers. Because when we say, I am the church, what we're focusing on is individuality rather than assembly. And the word church has in its inherent meaning the idea of assembly, not the individual. So when we hear someone say, I am the church, my next question is, well, what do you mean by that? And I knew what that young man meant because he said, I don't go to church. I am the church. No, no, no. Let's, let's stop and talk about what you mean. Yes, we are part of the body. But the body should assemble. The body can't never get together. The body can't, can't never, that's a double negative, but you know what I mean. It can't not ever do this thing, which is assemble. If we never assemble, we're not the church. So that's the first fallacy. The second fallacy is the every gathering is a church fallacy. I call this the Matthew 18.20 fallacy. Anybody without looking remember Matthew 18.20? Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. 
And people will say that. People say, I don't need to go to church. I gather every week with my family, or I gather every week with my Bible study, or I gather every week with my, now, nowadays, my Zoom meeting. And my Zoom meeting is my church because, hey, there's more than two people, and where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them. Well, uh, there's a Greek word for that. Guess what it is? Baloney. That's exactly right. Because that is not what that passage is even talking about. Matthew 18, 20 is actually referring, when it talks about the two or three, it's referring to the two or three witnesses that are called in the case of church discipline. So when we get to t church discipline, I think, which is week six or seven, we'll talk about that and how that two or three works together in that context. But for now, just understand this. The church has a biblically outlined structure, and it is not to be a disordered or chaotic mess. It is to be a body which is structured decently and maintains order. 1 Corinthians 14, 40. All things should be done decently and in order. If they're to be done in order, that means there's an order in which they have to be done, right? You can't call someone to order unless they know how to be in order. And the order of the church is what you're learning in this class. You're going to actually learn about the structure of how are elders affirmed and ordained? How are deacons called and put in position? How is the church to be structured? And what is the church to look like? What does it mean when it says all things should be done decently and in order? So, that's a fallacy. The Matthew 18, 20 fallacy. I'm going to move now to our third. This is our last fallacy for tonight. And then we'll move on. Our third dangerous fallacy is, this one's a little longer, Give you a second to write it. The ministry a church performs is more important than the teaching structure and practice of the church. <laughs> but you know what you know what it's saying. People will say this. Well, yes, I know that church doesn't preach the gospel, but they sure do a good job of feeding the hungry. Or I know that church doesn't really call sin sin, but boy, they sure do a good job of having trunk or treat right they have a great youth program right they have a great outreach program and so the ministry a church performs is more important than the teaching structure and practice of the church now here's here's something we need to understand i'm not saying that ministry is not important i'm not saying that we shouldn't do things to help people and we shouldn't have ministry in the world and all those things but what i am saying is that when those things take the place of the proper understanding of the gospel, what you end up with is a social justice club, not a church. Or a social ministry club, not a church. In fact, I'll, I'll give you a quote here. Everybody ready for me to move on? A common statement goes something like this. This church does so much for the community, slash homeless, slash needy, slash etc. Therefore, it must be a good church. What's the, what's the danger in that type of thinking? If somebody says, well, this church does so much for the homeless, it must be a good church. What's the danger in that kind of thinking? <coughs> yeah, they, they can be preaching heresy, right? right? I mean, honestly, a lot of cults do things that are, are, from a worldly standard, are good things. Feeding the hungry, clothing. I mean, <laughs> boy, this is going to get me in trouble. When I adopted my children, you know what I had to go through? Jewish family services. Because that's where my children were in foster care. Because Jewish family services does a great work with foster care. The Catholic church does a great work with foster care but that does not mean that what they teach is right that doesn't mean that their doctrine is correct even though they're doing these good things and praise the lord they're doing those good things they're they're fulfilling a ministry of common grace right and i'm thankful that god is allowing that and using that 
But that doesn't mean that I'm going to go to the Jewish church or synagogue. doesn't mean I'm going to the Roman Catholic church. Just because they do good things in the realm of what we would call common graces, it doesn't mean that what they're doing is right. Or rather, what they're teaching is right. Even if they're doing something that is, from a general uh, earthly position, a good thing. And so, the danger, and here's, like I said, maybe talking about Jewish family services or Catholic services is different. How about this? How about churches that aren't preaching the gospel, but they're feeding the hungry, and somebody says, well, I, I just, I, I want to go there because they're doing something for the community. If I go to this other church, I don't feel like they're doing enough. Well, that sounds okay, but why don't you go to the good church where they're preaching good doctrine and encourage them to begin doing the things that you think need to be done. Or maybe, hey, here's a good opportunity for you to serve in somewhere where you think something needs to get something started in that church rather than become complacent about theology and doctrine and go to a church that is, well, I don't, they're not really teaching the gospel, but hey, they got a great food truck. <clears throat> exactly. Exactly. So, and honestly, I mean, you know, not that I want to open the can of worms of the Masons, but there's a lot of questions about their teachings. But they do a lot of philanthropic things, right? But I ain't want to be no Mason. <laughs> don't want to go to the those things. I, I don't want to be a part of that. But we but we do it with churches. People do it with churches all the time. Well, that church is doing good things, therefore their ministry is correct. No, that's, that's not that's not the way it works. The purpose and mission of the church is actually given to us by Christ. The purpose and mission of the church is actually established in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. We call this the what? The Great Commission. And it is the commission to the apostles, but by extension is the commission to the church. What, what do we call the church of the first century? The apostolic church. And what was the commission to the apostles and by extension us? To go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them. Who's the them? The ones that were baptized. Who's the ones that were baptized? The ones who were made disciples. By the way, that's a good argument for believers' baptism. As believers are baptized. Disciples are baptized. And they are taught. Right? Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the commission of the church. Go into all the world, make disciples, baptize them. And how, did Paul, and how did we see this work out in the ministry of Paul and Peter and the other apostles in Acts? They would go to a town, they'd meet people, they'd preach the gospel to them, the people would believe, they would be baptized, and lo and behold, a church is born. You meet Lydia. Here's a woman that's got money and she's got a place, and so she becomes a believer and her place becomes the church. And people start to meet in her house. And the Philippian jailer believes, and he and his family are believers, and they are baptized. And what happens? You get a church in the house, right? And, and this happens all throughout as they go, and they make believers. And by making believers, they're making churches. I just taught through Colossians on Sunday morning, and I said Colossians was started, the church in Colossae was started not by Paul. Paul had never been there. It was started by Epaphras who had probably heard Paul preach the gospel in Ephesus, which is about 200 miles away from Colossae. And so Epaphras hears the gospel preached by Paul. He goes back to Colossae. He starts the Colossian church. And out of that springs three churches because he talks about the church in Colossae, Philippi, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Hierapolis and Laodicea, the, the Tri-City area, which was in the Lycus River Valley. All three of those churches probably spawned out of that ministry of that one man. And now he in, is mentioned at the end of the book of Colossians is going to be with Paul and urgently praying for them as God continues to do that work that was started there by him. Jesus gave us this exponential thing. You tell two friends, and they tell two friends. <laughs> you remember that commercial from back in the day? And so on, and so on. Right? That, so the gospel goes out through the preaching and making disciples. 
You make disciples. You baptize them. You teach them to obey what Christ taught them. And what did Christ teach them? Go and make more disciples. And so that's how the church is growing. And that's how the mission of the church is fulfilled. Now, here's a quick discussion question. Is there a difference between evangelism and discipleship? Somebody, raise your hand if it's yes. Raise your hand if it's no. You, you took this class before, didn't you? <laughs> uh, or, or have you? Uh, Billy Ray, have you taken this? Okay. <clears throat> In our modern vernacular, we make a distinction between evangelism and discipleship. Biblically speaking, however, making disciples is, is evangelism. That's, that's, that's the way we describe it in Ephes or Matthew 28. He didn't say go into all the world and make converts. He said go into all the world and make disciples. You teach them. So the ministry of the church isn't just about seeing someone become a believer but it's about growing as a believer. And so it's more than just, here's Jesus, take him or leave him. No, it's here's Jesus and let me teach you about him and teach you to grow up in him to become a mature believer. And so there's growth that's expected as part of that. But it begins with sharing the gospel, but it doesn't end there. And so while we can make a, we can make a technical distinction between evangelism and discipleship and say evangelism is sharing the gospel and discipleship is growing them in the gospel, really it's one thing. It's making disciples, which is the process that begins with belief and goes on through the process of sanctification as they grow up in Christ as part of the body of Christ. So, so that's when I say, there, yes, there, a distinction can be made, particularly in our modern context, but here's the problem. Some churches are so fascinated with evangelism, but not with growing believers. They want to, see, they want to hear people say those magic words, you know, I believe in Jesus, but then that's it. I'm going to jump ahead just for a moment. This is a man who you may have heard of. His name is Stephen Furtick. Stephen Furtick said this in his church to his church. I have the video to prove it. And he said, if you know Jesus, I'm sorry to break it to you. This church is not for you. Yeah, but I just gave my life to Christ last week at Elevation. Well, last week was the last week that Elevation Church existed for you. So what he's saying is, all we are is about evangelism. In fact, that's what he goes on to say. He says, we don't teach from books of the Bible because it gets in the way of evangelism. We don't offer different kinds of Bible studies because it gets in the way of evangelism. We don't teach doctrine because it gets in the way of evangelism. If you want to be fed God's Word or have God's Word explained to you, then you are a fat, lazy Christian. You need to shut up and get to work or you need to leave this church because we only do evangelism. I didn't say it. He said it. It's a direct quote. You can look it up if you want. But you see, this man has a wrong understanding of evangelism because he thinks all evangelism is is getting somebody to say, I believe in Jesus. And that's why I say we need to understand the connection between evangelism and discipleship. It's not just about getting someone to believe in Jesus. The church doesn't exist just to hear somebody say, I believe in Jesus. The church exists to teach them all that Christ has given and so that they can observe that and continue to go out and preach that. That's the, that's the issue. That's the point. I'm going to jump back now to where I was. I like what John Piper said. John Piper said evangelism exists because worship doesn't. What do you think that means? Here it is in a nutshell. He says, there are people in the world that should be worshiping God, but they're not. They're worshiping false gods or they're worshiping themselves. And he said, and they should be worshiping the true God. And he said, so we go out into the world to proclaim to them the God that they should worship because he's the only true and living God. And that's what evangelism is. It's pointing them to the one true and living God. Does God deserve worship? That's what I preached on this whole morning. God deserves to be glorified. And when we don't glorify Him, we're holding back that which belongs to Him. Therefore, we're robbing God of the glory that only belongs to Him. Soli Deo Gloria, right? That's all. It all belongs to Him. And the church is to be proclaiming that. I saw a picture today, man. I, I, I want a new pulpit. Because I saw a picture of a guy's pulpit. And across the front, it said Soli Deo Gloria. Big plaque across the front. I said, man, that's, that's, that's good eating right there. That's, that, 
Because it just reminds you through the preaching of the word, the teaching of the word, the discipline of the church, the discipleship of the church, the evangelism of the church, all of those things are for the one purpose, to glorify God. To glorify God. So the purpose and mission of the church is to create, in a sense, create worshipers. To go out into all the world and make disciples, make worshipers. And by the way, worship is an action of believers. It is categorically impossible for an unbeliever to worship God. That's a, that's a, think about that. Just think of it just for a moment. An unbeliever or a person who has not bowed the knee to Christ cannot properly worship God. It says it in Hebrews 11.6, Without faith it is impossible to please Him. Forever, whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. How in the world can someone worship God? This is why, and you say, why is he bringing this up? Because people will design the church for unbelievers. They'll create the entire worship service based on unbelievers. But an unbeliever cannot worship God. He can come and sit and listen, but until God changes his heart, until he goes through the process of regeneration and comes to faith and bows the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ, he's not worshiping because it's impossible to do so. Therefore, the gathering on Sunday is for believers. Many believe Sunday is meant to appeal to unbelievers. It's really not. Now, I'm not saying unbelievers should be excluded. We should not stand at the door and say, listen, if you're not a believer, you can't come in here. No, we welcome unbelievers, but we don't tailor the service to unbelievers. We don't tailor the event to unbelievers. We tailor the event to God. We don't even tailor it to believers. We tailor it to God <laughs> because He is the one who we're worshiping. I got myself a little out of order by jumping ahead to the Stephen Furtick. This brings us back to the Stephen Furtick when he said, this church isn't for you. That's wrong. The church is for believers. Unbelievers are welcome, but the church is believers, not unbelievers. It is wrong. Or excuse me, I'll ask the question. Is it wrong for a believer to want to grow in his knowledge of the understanding of the word? Stephen Furtick and his quote that I read a moment ago seemed to think that it was. He said, if, you're a, if you want to do Bible studies, if you want to study books of the Bible, you're a fat, lazy Christian, right? Well, let's think of that for a moment. Say what you want to about my waist size, but here's the reality. The Bible calls us to maturity. 2 Peter 1, verse 5, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What are the two key words? The key words are, they are, um, the qualities are increasing and keeping you from being ineffective. If you are not growing in your faith, there's a problem. And that's part of what the church does. When we gather together, we grow in our faith. And if we are not growing in our faith, that's a problem. Now, I will say this, and I'm not taking a step back. I'm just being honest. There are times in my life where I have grown greater than at other times. And sanctification, you know, we always talk about the line of sanctification. It's like start here, go here, like this. But the line really is more like, yeah, it's like, it's not exactly a straight line. And there are times where we struggle. There are times where we, we have seasons of drought. At least me. I don't know if you guys. <laughs> huh? Pray for me. Pray for me. But we should be seeking increase. As it says here, these qualities should be yours and should be increasing. And what are the qualities? Self-control, godliness, knowledge, steadfastness. These things should be increasing because they keep us from being unfruitful. They keep us from being unfruitful. Shepherds are charged with feeding the flock and many pastors are, un are unfortunately derelict in their duties. 2 Timothy 4 Beginning at verse 1, Paul says this to Timothy. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead 
and by His appearing in His kingdom, preach the Word. By the way, if you, are, if you have a desire to be an elder or a preacher in God's church, your job is right here. Here's, here's the job description. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by His appearing in His kingdom, preach the Word. Amen. That's my job description. Everything else is secondary to that. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. And here's the verse, verse 3. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Has that time come? It's interesting because it seems like it's almost cyclical. Like we see these times throughout history. But it is so amazing when we look out at how many churches and how many people in the, in the desire to simply have their ears tickled versus hearing the true word is so prominent right now. It's not everywhere. By God's grace, there are good preachers out there. There are godly men who are preaching the word, and some of them have sizable ministries, and we should be thankful for that. But the men I know who have sizable ministries still don't even touch the stadiums full of people who are willing to have their ears tickled. The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Yes? Is that what you're Seeker sensitive is one example. Um, that sort of goes along back when I was talking a few minutes ago <laughs> about using, trying to satisfy the world, trying to satisfy uh, what is unbelievers want, make the church based around that. That would fall into a seeker sensitive category. And that doesn't mean, again, that we don't care about unbelievers. We want them to come. We want them to hear the gospel. But at the same time, we don't tailor the worship around that. And that's what the seeker, the whole seeker sensitive movement was about that. Make the service as appealing to unbelievers as you can so that they will come and feel welcome. Even, I mean, I'll use Andy Stanley as an example. Andy Stanley is quickly becoming one of the most popular uh, preachers in the world, but yet he's a dangerous man. He teaches so many things that are just untrue. But the one thing in his church, membership in the church, can, is welcome to anyone, believer or not. They will allow, I heard him out of his own mouth. He wants the atheists to feel welcome and be able to join because maybe eventually they'll believe. And so, yes, that is an entirely different understanding of church and what makes the body of Christ than what the Bible gives us. The ultimate purpose and mission of the church is to glorify God. I should make you listen to this morning's sermon <laughs> if you weren't here because uh, that's what I talked about for 50 minutes. <laughs> This is done through the Holy Spirit-empowered work of making mature disciples who worship Him in spirit and truth. I'll say it again. The ultimate purpose and mission of the church is to glorify God. This is done through the Holy Spirit-inspired, I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit-empowered work of making mature disciples who worship Him in spirit and truth. All right, that takes us to the one-hour mark. We'll take a break, five minutes, and we'll come back and... Our next portion, after the break, we are going to discuss how is the church misunderstood. That's our next portion.
From our break and if you are one of our online students I hope you're still with us we are going to now move into the class discussion portion now I will I'm gonna say this because we do have so many online students now I don't know how to solve this problem but one of the problems that we have is people who watch online can't hear y'all even if I put this mic in the center of the room it's just not enough to pick it up and I don't want to pass a microphone around. So my best bet is I'm going to try to repeat your questions if you have questions or if you say something, I may try to repeat so that the people at home can hear. Because this portion is a discussion portion. In this class, each class has a built-in time where we're going to discuss issues. Because when it comes to church, if there, there's nothing if not plenty of issues. <laughs> Amen? I and mean, we've all had church issues, things that we've run across, things that we've dealt with. And I want to hear from you guys as best I can uh, uh, about these things. And tonight we're going to talk about how is church misunderstood. And I'm, 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 not, I'm not going to qualify that. Because I, I, have, I have several answers I'm going to put up, but I want you to go first. How do you think church, as it is today, is often misunderstood? As I said, if you give me an answer, I may repeat it, but... Give me your thoughts. And don't worry about mistakes. If you say something that's not right, we'll fix it. It's okay. I want to hear your thoughts. Da Daisy, you look like you had a thought. <laughs> no. Yes, sir. Uh, people base church on works and not the gospel. Okay. So you have churches that are based on works and not on the gospel. Okay, now is that something, remind me, I know your name, but just, uh, Daniel. Daniel, is that something you have experienced or you've heard about or seen? Uh, that's something that I've experienced and I've heard about it as well. Okay. You know, like, and it's one of your examples in class, like, you know, people just think that they're evangelizing, but the whole thing is the message of the gospel. Yeah, they've, they, met, they have co confused the gospel with a gospel of works. Do this and live. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, my, uh, I'm just watching a Luther movie, uh, Set Free. And you watched the Luther movie. Which one? The one, of, the one with how Martin Luther's 3009. Is it color? 3009. Nah, you guys need to watch the black and white. <laughs> watch the 50s one, man. So, what's the that movie style how the Catholic Church like, pretty much took advantage of like, Common, common people's salvation with, you know, well, not just with money, but also just like legalism. Like you say, you gotta give community, you gotta, you know, use take to the dead to get, to get you know, to the point of saying, but it was just like, wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I'm just thinking, and I think about my upbringing, my grandpa from the costume, and, and, I, and so you feel like, so you, I was taught to be, oh, you lose your salvation, you gotta do all these like extra good stuff to get, you know, you know, not wear tattoos, Set the music, uh, you know, it's like legalism, like, you know. Okay. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned the Catholic Church. Yeah. I would obviously agree that there's a lot of things in the Roman Catholic Church that are wrong. Yeah. But what are some of those things? What What are some of the ways that the Catholic Church has misunderstood the church? That might be a little more specific in the question. You said works, right? You think they, they, now, the Roman Catholic Church would argue, they would argue that they are not works based. This is their argument. However, in their own documents, in the Council of Trent, for instance, it says if any man says that he is saved by faith alone, he is anathema. If any man says that he is saved by faith alone, and it goes on to describe what they mean by that, and I can't quote that because I don't remember exactly what it says, but essentially, if any man says that he is saved by faith alone, that being, if any man says it is saved by faith that doesn't demonstrate itself by works. And again, we, we part, partly would agree in somewhat with this, but they go on to talk about the graces of those 
things and how the church distributes those graces, and there's where I would take great issue. But they essentially anathematize the doctrine of sola fide and say that sola fide is wrong. Sola fide is anathema, which means to be what? Cut off. Anathema means to be cursed or cut off. What would you say? Yeah, it means accursed. All right, so what's another way that the Catholic Church has misunderstood the church? Um, they call priest father. Okay, so misunderstanding the structure of the church? Yes. I would say that's an important thing. Yes. Because they have added, they have added positions that are not found in Scripture. What's the most what's the one you think probably is the most important position that they've added? Pope. Pope. <laughs> they have a position of one man who has authority over the entire church and he is able to speak infallibly because he is the apostle to the church. He is the living descendant of the apostolic uh, line. Huh? He's the vicar, of vicar of Christ. He is called the Pontex Maximus. He is uh, called the, uh, the, the Holy Father. All of these different titles given to the Pope, something that is certainly not found in Scripture. Okay, you uh, had another one. I believe they lied about Peter starting the Catholic Church. Okay. There's a false, there's like a false, uh, <coughs> a lot of Catholics think that Peter started the church, but Peter was unaware, I heard that Peter was unaware for 30 years that the Catholic Church started. Uh, that, you're a little confused on that too. <laughs> I, I would, I would, uh, because even what you just said is somewhat anachronistic. Yeah. The Roman Catholic Church, in the form that it is in today, did not exist during the time of Peter. Yeah, yeah, but that's why a lot of Catholics say that Peter started it, but it's false. I know, but okay, yeah, and I certainly would be that would be correct. Peter, Peter is not the uh, first pope, yeah. and that's the the doctrine that many of them believe. Oh yeah, because I know. Okay. Yeah, let's yeah, cuz they thought Romans they were like the they were like Peter. Okay. <laughs> Let me move on, okay? Yeah. All right. Uh when we talk about the church being misunderstood, we can talk about Roman Catholicism, what some other things. Other things in ways. I like I said I have a list I want to put up, but I I want to get your thoughts first. Membership's not really necessary. I Membership, can, I can, yeah. I can, I can attend the church and not be a member and be That's right. That's right. People will say membership is unbiblical. Well, that's our whole class. Next class, my hope is to prove that there's actually something to biblical church membership. Okay, church has been misunderstood regarding women pastors. In what way? I just wanted to hear your... Yeah, but it happens, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Anything else? I kind of get what people saying when they say this, but it's not a religious relationship. But they, get, they, they, they don't understand James 20, 27 about the true religion. Yeah. What? <laughs> I've heard that for a long time. You know where that term comes from? When people say it's not about religion, it's about relationship? It is actually a way of sort of individualizing faith. And that, and that is a very American thing. People want to separate faith from the church. And they want it to be an individual encounter with Christ versus something that is done corporately in, as a body where we experience Christ through the ministry of the church. And very popular in the 60s, 50s and 60s. It's not about a religion, man, because religion is, man, that's the man trying to hold us down. It's about a relationship with God. But the Bible actually uses the word religion in a positive way. You quoted James, that's true. It uses the word pure and undefiled religion. Is quoted. I know you're gonna, I know you know it. Yeah, it gives you an outline of what it is. It is to do these things. This is what religion looks like. Good and wholesome and pure religion, not the ungodly religion of the world. Yes, Corey. How about when they place worship over uh, basically the service? 
Mm -hmm. we'll put more emphasis on the music. Yeah. How about I would agree, and what what he said for those at home who can't hear, he said when Pete when they when they put more emphasis on the worship music than on anything else. But I would also add to that just as a thought, when they make worship a concert, right. make worship into an a, 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 an activity of spectation <laughs> rather than participation. <laughs> well, let me say this about that. I am not a fan of fog machines, but don't you dare throw anything at me. Well, that not, has nothing to do with church, but yeah, I got one. <laughs> I used to be a magician. I got a lot of things. I don't think a fog machine by itself automatically makes a church bad. And here's what I mean. And I'm going to disagree with the illustrious John MacArthur for just a moment. And I love John MacArthur, but I'm going to disagree with Dr. MacArthur on this. John MacArthur, his very famous quote, it's online, it's all over in memes. He says, he says take out all the colored bulbs and smoke machines and all these things. And, it, and I, I have to pull the quote up for you, but he, he quotes this sort of you know, litany of things, colored, colored bulbs and smoke machines and all that. But if you look at Grace Community Church... They have a full orchestra, very nice lighting, and a completely professional sound system in their auditorium. It is so professional. The, the pulpit raises and lifts out of the ground so that, the, yeah, the pulpit comes up and goes down so that the musicians can be seen while they're singing. So... When we start becoming really specific about, well, a, a smoke machine makes a bad church, but not this, I think we're, I, 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 think, I think you can have a smoke machine. I don't want one, <laughs> but I don't think that makes a bad church. Even though I get what you're saying, it, it leads to other things. It leads to that theatrical thing. But again, when I look at John MacArthur's church and I see a 60-piece orchestra and I see a 100-person hundred choir with huge speakers and a nice, you know, thousands of dollars in sound equipment, and then he's saying, but don't have colored lights. But wait a minute, okay, where's the, where do we draw the line? We have to be honest, right? Say, okay, this is good, and this is why, like, like R.C. Sproul, I love R.C. Sproul. And again, people are going to throw things at me. R.C. Sproul, no guitars, but we'll have a violin or a cello. Well, it's a whole different instrument. No, it's basically the same. I, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it has a different sound. But what makes one holy and one not? That's, that's my point. Is, is we, we get real particular about colored lights and, and smoke machines. Yes, I think they can lead to a problem. If, if that becomes the theatrical model and we're going after this concert appearance. But I, I'm, a little more, I'm a little more gracious on that than some people who would say, that makes a bad church. I, I'm more to say, okay... What's the preaching like? What's the word? What's the music? That's Because honestly, I just went to the ark, man. I spent three days at Ken Ham's ark. I don't call it Noah's ark. It's Ken Ham's ark. <laughs> I spent three days at Ken Ham's ark. They have a worship facility there. It's not really called a worship facility. It's their auditorium. But it is, I've, I've not seen a mega church with as grand a room as that. They had a huge digital wall that was behind Ken Ham as he spoke. So that when he was talking, there was a picture here and a video here and a picture here. I mean, it was it was it had to have been a hundred thousand dollars just in the screen. Does that make it right or wrong? Well, it's not a church. I know it's not a church, but it's a Christian facility. Does that make it right or wrong? Right. So these are just questions. Like I said, this is this is where we have to begin to say, okay, what's what's right and what's wrong, and what makes it right or wrong? Motivation, right? What's our motivation? So that's just a few thoughts. Like I said, I'm not chastising you, Corey. I know what you mean when you say smoke machine. That tends to lend to that concert feel. And I don't want to, I don't want one, <laughs> personally. But sometimes we do have to be careful not to make preference the rule and say, well, I don't prefer that, therefore they're wrong. That, that's, that's unsafe as well. Here are mine, just because we're running out of time, so I do want to get through these. How is church misunderstood? I have from within and from without. From within and from without. I'm sorry, I see Deborah squinting. I'm sorry, Deborah. 
Um, <clears throat> from within, church is misunderstood when it is considered to be more of a country or social club than it is a church. Now I'm going to talk about this church for a moment. I grew up here. I stepped my foot for the first time in Forest Christian Church in 1987. It was on Trout River Boulevard. And I was baptized in 1988 by Joe Jones, who was the pastor of Forest Christian Church. This church, that church building was sold in 1993 or 4, and then we bought this building and built it in 97. I remember because when I met my wife, we were still meeting in the school down the street while this building was being finished. And I met her on August 26, 1997, and we were still meeting in the school. And then she and I had the first wedding in this building on August the 1st, 1999. So I've been here long enough to say I know the history of the church. I've been a part of every committee that's ever been since the last 25, 30 years. And I've pastored the church. January will be 18 years that I've been the pastor. I've seen it go through Reformation. I've seen it go through change and God, by God's grace, even a name change to define us more specifically with our theological line. I've seen us adopt the confession, but I will say this. In the 80s and 90s particularly, there was very much a business model and a social club style of ministry. The focus was not on gospel preaching. Jack Bunning will tell you that, and he, he and I have been elders together. He will say that the gospel preaching was not the focus of the church. And that's a problem. Now again, I've been here throughout all that, so I'm not pointing fingers. I mean, I was, I was a part of it. But by God's grace, God let us out of that. And a lot of churches are still that way. My wife just read a book this week called Autopsy of a, De of a Deceased Church by Tom Rayner. If you don't know who he, who he is, he's with the Southern Baptist Convention and he does a lot of studies on churches that die. And he wrote this little book called Autopsy of a Dead Church. And she was just telling me about it as she was reading it. She found it at a yard sale. She's a great reader. She reads all kinds of stuff. And she told me about it. And she was saying some of the things that it was saying about churches that die are the same things that our church was going through in the 80s and the 90s. And by God's grace, we're still here. But we easily could have died because of those things. And one of the things is treating ministry like a social club rather than a church. Second thing, social programs for poor and needy. You say, wait a minute, that's bad? No, that's good. But if that's all that the church is, I'll give you an example. The United Methodist Church in many places is no longer preaching the gospel, but they're still proclaiming good, or they're still practicing good works for the poor and needy. It's misunderstanding the purpose of the church. Yes, is the church supposed to help the poor and needy? Yes, it is, but that can't be all. You, you, the church, let, let me ask you a question. Is it the church's job? Ooh, this is going to be a hard one. I, I don't want to argue. Is it the church's job to solve the problem of poverty? The poor you will have with you always. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We are told to love our neighbor, right? And we do. And we do those things. But we are not going to solve the poverty problem. We're not going to solve. We do those things because we love Christ and we love our neighbor. But we do them in conjunction with preaching the gospel to our neighbor. And when we eliminate gospel preaching and make those things our reason. Here, here's my issue with a lot of missions. People will say, I'm going to go do missions work. Okay, well, what did you do? We went to a poor country and we dug wells for a week. That's great. Who did you share the gospel with? Well, we couldn't share the gospel. All we could do was dig wells. Well, that's great. You gave them water, but you didn't give them Christ. And if you think I'm exaggerating, I've heard that story multiple times from people who say they have gone on short-term missions trips and they've built buildings, they've created schools, they've dug wells, but they weren't able to give the gospel. Well, then it's not missions. It's misunderstanding the purpose of the church. If Christ is not the focus of what we're doing, then it's not the church. Entertainment venue, this goes back to what Corey was saying. If, if performance opportunity is the, is the reason for the church, 
then that's misunderstanding the purpose of the church. How many, how many young pop singers had their start in church? I can name three off the top of my head. Kelly Clarkson, Katy Perry, whose father is a pastor. Britney Spears started in church. Uh, Elvis Presley started in church. What was the, I'm thinking of the other ones, blonde hair. I don't know if she did or not, but I was yes, thinking, okay, so we'll go with her. But there's another one I can't think of her name right now. She's on The Voice. I said Katie Perry. Christina Aguilera. They all say, yeah, we started out in church because church is considered a performance venue. How many people say, oh, I got to sing my special, right? Like, 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 like it's, that's the reason we go to church, is to sing the special because that's the focus. It's, it's an opportunity for performance. I know a lot of men who preach the gospel as a performance. Probably the scariest thing in my life is I don't ever want to be a performer in the pulpit because I am a performer by nature. I was a professional magician at the age of 16. And by professional, I mean paid to do it. That's how I met my wife. I was working as a professional magician. Her dad hired me to teach her magic tricks for a class she was in. I've always been a performer. I was in chorus for five years. I was in the band for seven years. I've always been a performer. And therefore, when I get behind the pulpit, I have to fight the urge not to be a performer because that's what I am by nature. But in the pulpit, I am a pastor and a preacher. And a, it's not about performance. It's about preaching the truth, you understand? And so I have to fight that. That's a battle. I know, I, I, know, I know what I am, so I know what it is. But some men gravitate toward that because they want to perform. And here's how you know. When a man wants to preach, but he doesn't want to love God's people, then you got a problem. Because that's a performer, not a pastor. I'm going to preach, but I'm not going to be among God's people. Shepherds should smell like sheep. Amen. I heard that 20 years ago, and I've held to it ever since. A shepherd should smell like sheep. It's not So that's how church is misunderstood from within. Performance, social club, a social justice ministry. This is not what the church is to be. But from without, it's misunderstood as well. People from without see the church. They see the church as greedy and money hungry. Is it true that some churches are greedy and money hungry? Yes. I have this thing right here. It says, story, watch your wallet. That, that, that's to remind myself. R.C. Sproul tells a story, or told a story, when he was still with us. He told the story of how he went to a baseball game as a little boy with his uncle. And his uncle did not have a good opinion of Christians. And when he went to the baseball game, he saw a man wearing a collar minister's collar and he said to his uncle what does that mean and his uncle said watch your wallet mm -hmm. so the so the outside view that some people have of the church is that the church is a place where people are mistreated financially I've, I mean, I've, been, I've been told that myself oh you were just there to, to take the offerings of the people and, and mistreat the people and, and uh, uh, fleece the flock is the term. Now, are there men who fleece the flock? Yes, there are. We can't deny that that does happen. But that's how the outside world misunderstands the church. It's just a money thing. Another way the church is often misunderstood is that it's just a gathering of hypocrites. Does the church have hypocrites? Well, let me, I, I want to say something about that because I, 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 I do believe that we all have a tendency to be hypocritical. But I, I, I'm, I, cautious, I caution people not to always say, well, we're all hypocrites. Because hypocrite means an actor. The word hypocrisis in the Greek means someone who put, does what they do because they're putting on a show. And we are not to do that. We are to, we are to be genuine even in our failures. The hypocrite is the person who says they never fail. They're the person who stand out and say, and I don't think that's you, I don't think that's me, I don't think we say we never fail. 
That's the hypocrite, the person who stands up like the Pharisee and the, the story I told this morning with the Pharisee and the tax collector who says, look at me, God, I do this and I do that. I'm not like the tax collector. No, I say I am like the tax collector. And by God, that's why I need Jesus, right? I need him because I am like the tax collector. I'm worse. So I get what you're saying. We all have, we all have potential for hypocrisy, but the true hypocrite is the Pharisee who doesn't see himself as ever failing, but sees the failures of others. And there is, there is a problem with that. And the world sees the church and they say, oh, they're all a bunch of hypocrites. No, a hypocrite says they don't need to be fixed. We all recognize we're broken. And so, um, yeah, if you go to a church where everyone's holier than thou, that's a problem. And there are churches that are like that. Last one, at least on my list, and maybe this has generated some thoughts among you. The last one is church is a political social or a political engine. And I, I put in, i.e., the Christian right. Now, my wife and, had, my wife and I had a really good talk about this recently because we were asking the question, you know, can somebody be a Christian and vote for people who believe in things like abortion and things like that? And we were talking about lesser of two evils, and we were talking a little bit about Christian ethics, which was what our last class was about. But ultimately, we, you know what I mean when I say there are churches that are merely political engines. They're pushing a political narrative rather than a biblical narrative. You don't believe that? I see some of you looking at me kind of funny. You know it's right. And it happens on both sides. I said political right. There's just as much there's a political left. I, 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 I see videos. People send me videos all the time. And I see videos of pastors who are preaching things like BLM. And they're preaching things like wokeism and social justice. That's just as bad. But on the, on the other side, there are guys... Who are preaching, you know, MAGA. Which again, you may believe in Trump or whatever he's all about, but that's not what we preach. Right? We preach Christ over all, blessed forever, amen. And there are some real people who get confused about Trump, and I've seen some pictures of real blasphemous stuff where Jesus is being held up by Trump and all this garbage. That's that's dangerous. I went into a church one time that had so many American flags that every wall was adorned with American flags on every side. And they had, it's, I can tell you where I was at. I'm not going to on video, but I, I, I was at a church. It was here in town. I walked in, and it looked like <coughs> Betsy Ross threw up. It was just red, white, and blue everywhere. And on the back of the church, they had a shelf that had the bust of Abraham Lincoln and all these other things in this shelf. And it, was, it looked like a political party rally not a church. So it does happen. Church is misunderstood when it's seen as these things. So those are just some thoughts. Maybe you have some others now that I've mentioned that and we're basically out of time. Anybody have anything they want to ask or say before we close? No, y'all want to go home. I do too. Okay. All right. So this is our first class. I hope you uh, learned a little bit about what we're going to be doing, what we're going to be talking about. And uh, hopefully throughout this series, you'll learn a little bit more about the purpose and nature of the church. Next week, we're going to talk about joining a local church and asking the question, is local church membership <coughs> biblical? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you that we have had the opportunity to discuss it, particularly in regard to Christ's words where he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Lord, we know your church is in this world for your purpose, and the purpose is to glorify you by raising up men and women as disciples and making mature disciples through the process of teaching your word and and going out and proclaiming it to the world so i pray lord that tonight as we go from this place we will understand even more the value of the local church and that you would be glorified in our study we pray this in christ's name amen, amen.